Okay, well, I was. Uh, turns out we're running ahead of schedule. So what uh, we thought is I would try to go through this in a little more detail. Um, and then uh, we'll break for lunch, uh, have a network and lunch, and then uh, those of us from D.C. will be here to handle one-on-one -on -one questions till um, probably 2 o'clock, I think, something like that. So um, let me go th through this um, uh, more specifically. Uh, I'll try not to just repeat what I said before, but uh, uh, I probably will. Um, okay. You have uh, the, one of the neat parts about the uh, proposal process for SBIRs is it's 20 pages. You're limited to 20. You know, even though it says 20, we'll often get people who deliver more than 20. <laughs> uh, if that's the case, um, we we just throw away the last uh, pages of it. So you only may get halfway through your commercialization or your resumes or whatever. So. Um, uh, that's the, that's the way we work it, so follow the rules. And I guess that's the one thing that I would just beat the drum on, which is read the uh, instructions and follow the instructions. And if you have questions about them, uh, pick up the phone, and uh, at NAVC, I would have you call Dean Putnam. At, uh, uh, and of course, now you've got Dean's, you'll have, you've got Ryan's contact info here. Um, but if you're, you know, going after a nav air or a spay war, you know, pick up the phone. If you have questions, talk to the, uh, the SBIR managers at the command level who uh, uh, work that. Second is um, narratives uh, are provided in debriefs to unsuccessful offers. Now, the, what you're going to find is that the Congress has mandated that we announce winners in uh, 90 days. And, uh, and we will do that. You have 15 days from that notification letter for winners and losers to request uh, debriefs. And it'll typically be a one sheet, uh, well, I think it's usually one sheet, a debrief of a synopsis of what people thought your strengths or weaknesses were in each of the three areas. I always tell people to request the debriefs. There's one prepared for every proposal that comes in. Sometimes people don't request them, and so they don't get sent out. Uh, if you're a winner, uh, I would suggest that you get it and then discuss it with the technical point of contact at the first time you have a meeting with them to make sure you understand that, uh, where they thought your, your proposal could have been better. Um, so, that, so, but debriefs, I always found uh, very useful. Um, proposals are scored on the three criteria, technical merits 40%, uh, quality of personnel and commercialization are each 30%. Now, let's take a look at what a technical merit evaluation guide is. So this is, this is what we teach the evaluators. Uh, they come in, sit down, and we run through them this. To be excellent, it has to be complete, innovative, revolutionary technical solution. And uh, technical uh, achievability is, is likely with a high payoff. Um, that gets you in that the top 30 to 40 uh, range. Good is it's complete, well thought out. Uh, technical uh, achievability is, might be more risky. Um, and so, you know, you go from the sure thing to something that has a lot of, that has a payoff, but you're assuming the risk, and the government assumes that risk with you when we, uh, when we fund you. And then, uh, and then you, you work down to, uh, you know, the, the fair is it's a varied or a partial solution. Maybe your particular innovation is really great in one area, but it only addresses half the problem. And, uh, and then uh, poor is, uh, you know, your technical solution is vague, missing uh, pieces, and doesn't really address uh, a solution for the topic. So, um, anyway, these, that's, the, that's the general guide. And... Um, you know, I don't know how you would want to use this. Maybe, you know, you have one, some people in your organization write the proposal and then somebody else review it. But uh, 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 anyway, the, the, other, the other piece is that you do have this 30-day period that we're in now where you can call the topic authors and the points of contact and try to make sure that if there's any ambiguity in the write-ups, you can try to iron that out over the phone with them. And that is still, and this is the only procurement that I'm aware allows that. Uh, everything else is usually written 
uh, and then the answers are published to the world. In this case, it is uh, between you and the uh, TPOC on the phone. Uh, after the 30-day window, then any questions you ask need to be in writing, and they will answer them, but all answers will be published uh, to uh, online. Um, the Quality of Personnel Evaluation Guide, and, um, you know, what people look for here, is, well, we can go down there. The qualified personnel, highly capable of producing the needed technical solutions and transitioning or commercializing the technology. Um, so that might be not only just a good technical guy, but maybe have a good technical guy who's complemented by a very good business guy or sales uh, thing or a good teammate who uh, says they're going to uh, draw that in uh, to their, their systems if it's successful. Um, let's see, support from um, uh, a potential customer is uh, always a good thing to have if you can uh, get that. Um, but I think the, uh, uh, the point here is that, uh, you know, you got to, A, you hit all the, the things good, it's qualified, capable of producing the needed technical solution, and it's, uh, uh, you know, you, you have a good shot at getting the commercialization. So what's the difference between highly capable and, uh, and, and being merely capable? Uh, that's probably knowing the landing pad you're going to go to and having some contacts or insight and information in that area. Uh, the, uh, I happen to like it, and this is, was my preference when I used to evaluate these, was that if the, cut, if the, uh, if the offerer understood what it took and talked about what it took instead of just saying, yeah, we're going to give it we're going to put the burden on the TPOC to do the integration and figure out where it goes. So uh, in some cases, the TPOC side of the house works. In other cases where you can, say you know who the end customer is and have it identified how you work there. Um, personnel with some ca capability of producing affairs is, uh, uh, is needed a technical solution in transitioning or commercializing the product. So with just a minimal capability, uh, you know, this again, um, I think it, it, it's subjective, but they do use the evaluation criteria as relates to the bio, uh, the resumes that they see. And then um, uh, personnel with a weak capacity. I think I mentioned earlier, don't be afraid to say that, hey, we're really good in this, but we're not a, a good in the application of it in your specific instance, so we're going to go bring somebody in of a certain caliber or make an agreement to use the resume to get it in there that said we'll hire Joe Smith who's a retired Navy captain uh, for this kind of a job. Um, I always found that as being as demonstrating a level of maturity uh, of, a, of a small business to recognize that they were strong here, had some shortfalls, but we're filling that through teaming and bringing on a consultant. Uh, so. And, and I would say rarely, uh, it de again, depends on how you want to structure it, but um, somebody with an impressive resume to you is going to be have an impressive resume to somebody who's evaluating it as well. So uh, it's just if you're trying to fit a round person into a square hole that you see the problematics. Uh, commercialization. Uh, so the potential, and again, this is the one where most companies fail. Uh, to really uh, give them to do justice with their innovation. Uh, potential technology application for Navy use is high, will be highly beneficial to the Navy, okay, and therefore likely. So, uh, you probably, I'm sounding like a broken record here, but think about your end item. Many broad applications, but think about some specific ones, and if you're going to be dealing with uh, uh, you know, maybe you've made contact with Electric Boat or Raytheon or, or Lockheed Martin. Uh, maybe they don't have a letter of endorsement, but uh, you know who your customers are, who owns those systems, and how to contact them. Uh, or if you've done work with them before, that's uh, probably even better to include. Um, the potential, the good is potential for is the potential for technology application for Navy use is good and will likely be beneficial. Um, and that is, 
you know, as is. The difference between good and high is kind of in the eye of the beholder. Uh, but I think that um, the more you can put about understanding, you know, the competitive natures, the cost reductions uh, that maybe you bring, or the other redeeming virtues other than just performance, maybe it's weight. As uh, we talk, that's an important thing on all our platforms. Um, the FAIR is potential of technology application for Navy use is FAIR and could be beneficial. So, beneficial in the Navy. Uh, again, cost, weight, uh, you know, ease of uh, integrating it into the systems. And POOR is potential of technology uh, application for the Navy is poor and unlikely to be beneficial. So, yeah, it could do something that could maybe replace something that we have there. Uh, maybe it brings some added value, but it, but it costs more, or it weighs more, or it doesn't really just drop in. Or there's collateral uh, implications to the ship installations or systems that uh, make it, this is cheaper, but for me to use this, I have to spend a lot of money uh, getting it. Kind of like that example I gave on the cables. <laughs> Uh, hey, I can save you a lot of running one fiber. Yeah, but I got to get everything on and off the fiber. Uh, so think about those collateral damage, uh, or not damage, but implications that roll with it. And then, um, and then non-responsive, the technology has no value to it. Uh, or, you know, oftentimes you, I shouldn't say often, at different times you may find that uh, maybe the Navy has already tried something that you're offering. And it, and they tried it and it didn't work. Uh, and that would come out in the debrief to you. So, uh, so know your customers. Uh, you know, one of the interesting things is uh, at uh, that, that uh, prime symposium uh, summit that was held uh, last week. Um, one of the one of the common themes that came out of it was that everything. Everything seemed to establish, evolve around establishing relationships. How do you learn to do business with the government? You know, you have your technical arms and legs, the technical warrant holders, maybe they're at the field activity or headquarters. You got your program side of the house where they've got the money and the requirements. Uh, you have the prime contractor's role. Maybe it's a block upgrade to delivered systems in the fleet. Uh, so a lot of it is, is un having an appreciation for what your customers' problems are and how you and your solution can, uh, can solve that. Uh, as mentioned, somebody, you know, we, I think generally we have about 30% of the uh, new winners, our brand new winners that uh, every one of these go-rounds. Uh, and we will see that uh, uh, they've got a learn more about uh, what well, gives them the opportunity to start establishing relationships with the different decision makers in the process. So I know it doesn't sound real great with, gee, I got a great solution, but uh, I don't talk well, I don't deal well. Well, that's part of the game, unfortunately, is to establish those relationships. Uh, my own personal experience is that after you get to know a lot of companies and you've seen them perform in phase one successfully and you've given them phase twos and they perform successfully, well, hey, then you're in pretty good shape to be confident that you can give them a several million dollar job. Um, but if a company demonstrates they can't really perform a phase, manage money on a phase two contract, why would you ever give them a bigger one to, to manage? So, but that's all part of relationship building. and. Uh, uh, I know it's hard to not write, you can't really write all that up in, a, in your commercialization part, um, but when you do win, take the opportunity to really utilize that, uh, that access that you now have. Um, ultimately, you've got to demonstrate the value you bring, and I think I touched on that. Um, you know, all programs are driven by cost. I mean, yeah, we're supposed to deliver ships and guns and bullets and systems. Um, and when you're dealing at the nav C level, um, your probability of success is expected to be high because the program managers are expected to be high. Um, and so uh, you know, I'll give you an example with um, 
the last aircraft carrier when they when they got rid of the steam catapult. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but basically we use catapults to launch airplanes off the uh, carriers to get them at accelerated at speed. They used to be steam generated, and uh, the uh, more recent carriers developed an electromagnetic uh, catapult system. Um, that was a, uh, a revolutionary change to what had been in place for many, many years, and it had its growing pains. And of course, the papers love that, you know, overrun, so many dollars, etc. Um, but, but the reason is, is because the expectation of Congress, the media, DOD, senior people, expect that thing to actually work, because it's at NAVC and the advanced development work was supposed to have been done successfully, and the transition to this new capability was expected to go flawlessly. Well, we know it never really goes flawlessly, but it's expected to work. So, um, uh, as a result, you know, we get hammered on development costs or ship construction costs, et cetera. So, anything you can do as part of telling about your product and reducing cost is a big deal. And like I mentioned earlier, um, if you can come up with a product that solves a problem here and reduces the secondary and you know all the interfacing equipments, it's easy and cheaper to put on board ship. It's more reliable once you get it there. Uh, those are all things to kind of tout as part of your proposal and, uh, and why it should be commercialized and installed rapidly. Um, quantify and compare your products versus existing if you have access to that. Uh, whether it be size, weight, power, cooling, uh, costs. Um, and um, as I said, your, 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 your business model, and you may even want to include this in your, tech, in your uh, commercialization thing. We can be a government furnished piece of equipment. We can be a uh, prime, uh, you know, a vendor to a, a prime contractor or, uh, you know, to a system that goes on your ships as GFP. <laughs> so, recognize that there are different ways of contracting for SBIRs, um, and demonstrate that you're flexible in any of them. Uh, uh, and, uh, again, how to engage your, uh, your customer. Um, keep your point of contact engaged, and that's your technical guys, uh, as well as the sponsor. We've given you, I think, three names for every one of these topics between the PEO or organizational SBIR sponsor, the first and second authors. All of those are people that you should figure out how to network, whether it's a weekly phone call or a monthly phone call, or if you're in D.C., make an appointment to go see them, uh, invite them up to your site. Uh, all, all ways of uh, starting to establish uh, building relationships. Um, Let's see, know your end users, uh, sailors, labs, technical experts, uh, they're all different. Like a sailor is an end, uses an end item that's on a ship, but a technical agent uh, like to comment about uh, automatic testing of distributed systems. That would probably be somebody at a laboratory uh, who would be very interested in their jobs of certifying that the systems work and work consistently uh, or certifying them ready for sea. Uh, the technical experts, certainly in the areas of algorithm development, you're going to have to have test cases and be able to demonstrate that. Um, and by stating these things in your write-ups, you actually start to uh, uh, build that confidence early in your proposal and then you execute it that way. How, do, how your product or process can reduce risk, uh, solve obsolescence, uh, introduce competition or improve performance. Um, and those are the four areas that I typically pitch to program managers as to why they should get engaged in the program. And it goes back to my comment about who's got a f fully funded risk reduction program or who doesn't have obsolescence that's used in today's technology. Uh, and there are different ways to solve these. So. Uh, what happens to your problem? This is always a, an interesting thing is that you spend all this time doing research, getting prepared, a proposal comes, uh, RFP comes out, you write your proposal, uh, you, you upload it into the system, and then everything goes dark for at least 90 days. 
And what happens is your proposal comes in. It comes in through the Department of Defense portal. The Department of Defense has this, uh, Defense has this large RFP they put out uh, this time uh, of year, and I guess it was October. Uh, they have two more that they put out. The responses are usually, the content is less, and the responses are usually less for the 16.2 and .3 that will come out later this year. Um, they do a, uh, basically a sort, uh, make sure that things have been compliant. Uh, if, you're, if you don't follow directions, it can fall off the, uh, the table at the DOD level. Um, and it comes into a Navy portal at the Office of Navy Research. They're the SBIR program manager. Many of you probably knew uh, John Williams. He's now uh, at SBA, and uh, Bob uh, Smith is the uh, SBIR program manager. Um, it comes into a program management database that he has set up, and those are delivered literally to the desktops of the evaluators. Um, and so they go online, everything is done digital, there's no, really no uh, uh, paper documentation at all. It's all, uh, all digitally done. Um, it's provided back to the program manager's database. And then the NAV CSBIR program manager, and that's kind of where, uh, like, Ryan, Dean uh, Putnam run, and with uh, help in that office, uh, basically we take a look at it and say, okay, has it, got, has it passed the quality assurance test? Uh, you know, we're, we, we try to make sure people have chosen their words correctly, that their words justify the uh, their, uh criteria for, you know, good, fair, excellent. Uh, we try to make sure that the offer, the proposed, proposal evaluators are consistent. We understand everybody's not going to be lockstep, but, um, you know, if one gives it a, a, a high good and the other one uh, a low excellent, well, that kind of makes sense. But we don't want to see somebody saying ex excellence versus uh, non-responsive. Uh, that tells us they haven't done their job, and then we get the chairperson and people involved to go back and reconcile these sorts of things. Um, and the uh, uh, yeah, and then the other thing is that we are required to go request a waiver from the SBA uh, if we don't make our 90-day window for putting out the uh, 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 notifications as to who the winners are. Uh, in 90 days. Well, you know, depending on the volume of stuff we get, that can be challenging. We, depending on the, uh, uh, lots of times when money shows up, because we actually pay all the evaluators, and they're spread all over the country. They're in Crane, they're in Newport, Rhode Island, they're in, uh, you know, depending on where it is, Panama City, um, all over the place. So, uh, so anyway, the review is done by the evaluators. The chairperson is to reconcile it. The products that, that, that they produce, we go through. Uh, and I believe actually, uh, uh, as it gets to us, the folks in the room here help uh, review that, uh, uh, the comments to make sure. We track uh, numbers of, of proposals received versus numbers of proposals opened because we have access to the database, we can say, oh, they've opened it. Well, that's good. Have they completed their evaluations? And uh, some of these are pretty thankless. Uh, I can remember one where uh, we wanted a head window uh, to, to do water shedding uh, when a periscope came out of the water. And I think there were over 60-some-odd proposals. All of them had rain -X in it someplace. Uh, so, um, that's it. So, so getting somebody motivated to review 60 proposals, all of which said raining, uh, it was kind of a challenge. Um, so who are the evaluators? Uh, you know, the chair provides the checks and balances, uh, tries to award for poor terminology and, uh, and variances in them, uh, wide, I should say wide variances uh, uh, in the scoring. Um, and uh, the evaluators are supposed to be more uh, attuned to the specific item, uh, like it could be a program manager, tech warrant holder, or an engineer. Um, at NAVC, we have what we call technical warrant holders, and uh, these are folks who are empowered 
to basically take the position for the system engineer and the engineering director at a NAVC. So the technical warrant holder for welding is, a, is somebody who would uh, be the person who, could, who establishes the policy and positions on things. There may be a number of people who work for him who also do welding, but there's only one technical warrant holder per period. Um, as part of the one-on-one -on -one sessions later on, we do have our list of the tech warrant holders. Again, that's not public information because of the PII uh, issue, but uh, we will give you the names to, uh, to be able to follow up with. Um, so they, they typically are related to the topic, uh, whether it be technically or programmatically. Uh, we do not typically use uh, sailors uh, unless unless they're part of a program office and assigned there, we will. But we don't go out and try to get people from the development squadron uh, in Norfolk or New London, say, to, to evaluate things. And, um, and I think, as, oh, the post-evaluation. Yeah, that's the non, we have the 90-day window. If we miss the 90-day window, we, we have to put ourselves on report. Well, you can imagine how nobody in the command wants you to, put yourself on report because you have to go to the SBA and uh, uh, and you have to formally request a waiver and you got to tell them why you're late and all this stuff. Uh, so we really work to try to do that. That's why we track, you know, when proposals are open, when the evaluations are completed, when, they, when they're delivered to us. Um, winners are all notified through NAVCO2, which is the contracting organization. So while all the work is, is done by evaluators and the SBIR office, uh, the, the technical, the contract officers are the ones who are going to be your interface to us. Um, companies of non-winning proposals are encouraged to request a debrief. It's typically a one-page write-up. Um, and if you want uh, to know more, I would suggest you would contact uh, somebody like Whitney or Ryan, and, and uh, we'll figure out how to get you, uh, you know, a personal contact with, with somebody uh, who, probably one of the authors who wrote it up. Um, and then, uh, uh, and I, like I said, I always encourage winners to get a debrief, um, and, uh, and then to really have that dialogue with the TPOC to understand how you could go from a good to an excellent proposal. And uh, winners are, are uh, like I say, permitted to, to get them. And, um, and the reason that you want to ask is we try, we try when the scoring comes out, I say we, the uh, technical managers at the, each of the PEOs uh, and directorates end up having to make break points, whether you're going to have one award or three awards. I said that on average there's uh, one award made for every eight proposals. If we had uh, 16 offers come in, and the top three, or we're all clustered at you know 91 to 95. We would, and the next one's an 80. We would probably want to make three awards, uh, but um, you know a lot of that depends on the budget. Can they afford three awards? And so that's the unfortunate part when you get lots of well clustered uh, uh, proposals. That's you know somebody has to not get it, and that's where we count on the chairman and the uh, T box and the uh, uh, budget managers in each of the POs to make that call. So, um, let's see. And I think that's it. So, um, hopefully this gives you a little insight as to what goes on once your proposals are uh, delivered and, uh, and turned around. Thank you.